Jesus was led up by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So today we begin the journey of Lent, our time of preparation for the experience of the cross and the grave. Lent is this season, as we've been mentioning, of self-examination, of repentance, and recommitment to God's way. So fittingly, it begins with this tone of solemnity, prayer, and confession as we face fully our human frailty and failings. We mark ourselves with ashes and declare ourselves dust. Gracious God, we prayed at the beginning of this service, strengthen us to face our mortality. Strengthen us to face our mortality. But you know, the beginning of Lent is not the only time we face our mortality in the church here. And the practice of receiving ashes is not the only one that we use to do so. We may not always think of it, but our sacraments, communion and baptism, are also reminders of mortality. We might start with communion. It's a life-giving meal, but the symbolism that's at the heart of this practice, bread and wine, these are elements that are only possible in a way because of death, because of the crushing of grain and grapes. Do you know Jesus himself talked about his death using this imagery? This is from the Gospel of John. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, Jesus said, alluding to his crucifixion. Truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it does fall to the earth and die, it bears much fruit. Jesus is that grain of wheat, that single seed. The breaking of his body seems like defeat, but it turns into victory. It bears fruit. Just as a seed breaks open and allows the possibility of new life in growth, so Jesus' body breaks open and allows the possibility of eternal life in resurrection. This is why we retell the story of Jesus' death and resurrection every time we gather around the communion table. We talk about his final meal of bread and wine with his friends. We talk about his death that turns into life. We proclaim that this bread and wine is the body and blood of Christ. Even the names of the linens that we use reflect Jesus' death. The square covering you see me take off of the chalice and the plate is called a pall. It's the same word we use for the covering that goes over urns or caskets at funerals. Here at communion, it covers the body of Christ. So even as we come to the communion table, we are reminded of the intersection between life and death. We are invited to face our own mortality, our own dependence on God's provision. We do live by bread, but not by bread alone. We live by God's word and Jesus is God's word, that nourishment for us. So at the table, we are invited to remember Jesus' death and its opening into new life. 
Well, in baptism, the life and death symbolism is even more obvious, especially if we remember that in biblical times, baptism entailed full body immersion. So there's this moment under the water where there's no breath, but then the baptized person comes up from the water and takes breath again, a new creation. In ancient times, baptismal candidates actually took off all their clothes and left them behind before they stepped down into the immersion pool. And when they came up, they were given new clothes, spotless clothes, as a symbol of their forgiveness and recreation. This is where the tradition of white robes come from that, that worship leaders wear. They're baptismal garments. Still today, many baptismal candidates wear white. I mentioned funeral palls earlier and how they're connected to communion, but they're also an echo of baptism. Lutheran funerals actually begin with a thanksgiving for baptism. We remember and give thanks for the baptism of the person who has died, and we connect that full circle to their death. We cover them with a white pall, just like their baptismal garment had covered them. And we remember that life and death are connected and God is present in all. But again, we can look to scripture to make this connection the most explicit of all. Paul writes in Romans that we are buried by baptism, a death, a drowning. It's kind of shocking, right? And Paul meant it to be shocking. Here's, here's Paul writing in Romans. All of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into Christ's death. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, so we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is a coming back to life, a resurrection. And the way to resurrection is through death. Paul wanted the early church to remember that, to remember that baptism was a dying to the old self and a rising to a new creation in Christ. When someone is baptized, the pastor makes the sign of the cross with the water on their forehead, right? Says, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Well, today, on Ash Sunday, the imposition of ashes is an echo of that symbol, right? The ashes, the same symbol in the same spot, just different words. So all of these practices, communion, baptism, ashes, they all bring us face to face with our mortality. But in doing so, they also bring us face to face with God's grace. Strengthen us to face our mortality, we prayed, with confidence in the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Strengthen us to face our mortality with confidence in God's mercy. That's the message of the ashes. You are sinful, yes, but God in Christ is merciful, and you can trust that. Lent is this time of coming back to that promise of, of inter, you know, reflecting on our inner spiritual lives. And those spiritual disciplines, they don't make us any more holy or any more loved by God. They bring our attention back to the right place, to God, and they help us grow in our discipleship. Just like Jesus did, we will face temptations. We will be pulled, enticed even, away from God. But just as Jesus rooted himself in scripture, in the declarations of God's goodness, we can do the same of all the things vying for our attention, and there are many. We can remember that it is truly only God who deserves our worship. And we can be assured that when we do that confession, when we practice this Lent, as we come before God and reorient ourselves, we will be met with God's mercy. God has already said yes. And when we pray as the psalmist does, create in me a clean heart, O God, God says yes. When we pray, renew a right spirit within me, God says yes. When we pray, restore to me the joy of your salvation, God says yes. When we pray, sustain in me a willing spirit, God says yes. God will meet us right where we are and grant us the grace we need for this season of Lent and for all seasons of our lives. So reminders of our failings are indeed front and center during Lent. We are human, we are flawed, we are finite. 
but reminders of God's grace are also front and center. We are known, we are loved, we are forgiven. And even though we have buried the Alleluia for this time, even though the shadow of the cross looms large during Lent, we know that all of Lent points to Easter and to the light that shines beyond. Christ's resurrection conquers sin and death and brings us eternal life. And all our most central practices, including our gathering around the font and the table, remind us of that. So as you come to the table today, remember that you are human, and remember that God's mercy is always available to feed you here. And as you remember your baptism, perhaps even touching the water of the font or making the sign of the cross, remember that you are human and you are a beloved child of God, marked with the cross of Christ forever. And as you feel the ashes touch your forehead today, you remember the same thing. Your body may not last forever, but God's love will, even beyond your death, and it will hold you for eternity. Thanks be to God. Amen.